welcome Hector Fernandez Lueste from the tropics. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so, the tropics. <laughs> I love your background. It makes me feel uh, like I really need my margarita on the beach right now, Hector. Actually, um, I would enjoy a Corona, but the right type of Corona. <laughs> Okay, I set you up nicely for that one, I think. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about your journey here. Uh, man, you are, you know your music, and I just learned that your son also knows his music. But, um, so it's not, it's the apple not falling so far from the tree, right? But yeah. Latinx pop culture, comics, digital humanities, how in the world did you get to these scholarly spaces, Hector? Uh, well, when I first landed uh, in grad school at Stony Brook, um, I was pretty much puzzled by the degree of, of ignorance. This is back in the early 90s, all right? Long time ago, prehistory. The degree of ignorance, uh, even within the academe, for uh, Latin exes, and, and Latin Americans. Um, I mean, generally speaking, back then, uh, the Anglo world didn't have a clue. Uh, I apologize for that. But it, it, it fed my concern for a practice, an academic practice that uh, informed everybody better about uh, the way things were not only uh, north of the border, but also south of the border, because I see them as intimately related. Back then, I remember uh, I started writing about comics and rock. And I mean, very few people, if any, wrote about comics or rock. Uh, within the US academe, comics on rock having to do with uh, you know, Latinos, uh, Latinxes in the, in the States, uh, and Latin Americans in general. Uh, Back then, uh, there was a, a conference that's still being held. I, you, you're familiar with it, ICAF. And back when we started uh, meeting at ICAF, uh, in terms of people working on Latinx stuff or Latin American stuff, it, it was, I mean, perhaps three, four of us, that's about it, perhaps. Uh, nowadays, it's much better. Nowadays, it's obviously much better, and, and the academic presses uh, happily are paying attention to the market, and they have supported the research. Uh, and you see people building uh, full academic careers on, on research of this nature, which uh, kind of makes you feel very validated uh, because you, you realize there, there's an impact on, on the field and the, the academic practice. Absolutely. What would be a kind of, um, I don't know, elevator pitch takeaway from excavating in these spaces, especially spaces that understand a linkage between the Americas or the Americas as a space of cultural production? See, that's, that's kind of hard because when you, when, uh, Basically, I started working on cultural studies, right? And, and through cultural studies, I went into comics um, and went into music. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the focus or the way uh, cultural studies developed in the U.S. Uh, is markedly different from the way it developed in Latin America. In Latin America, it was uh, mostly nourished within uh, social sciences departments. Whereas in the States, it was more uh, founded on, on humanities, right? The humanities played a bigger role. So uh, there is a very contrasting picture um, in terms of that. Um, in a way, it was good because it, it helped, uh, you know, make contact with uh, other disciplines. And it's, it's always good to be interdisciplinary. Uh, and, and within the States also, uh, though I would have to say that uh, in the U.S. it was harder to uh, cut across disciplines when it, when it came to research. Um, most of us were all humanities related 
And when I had contact in, in terms of, of comics or music with, with other disciplines, um, though we reached out, uh, it, would, it, was, it was hard for people from other disciplines to go beyond that. Um, now I would like to think it's, it's, it's better because, um, you know, years have gone by and uh, the people you met back then, you know, we have all advanced in our careers. So, um, so people are more acquainted. I mean, I see what uh, other colleagues work on and, I, and they see what I work on and it's no longer a novelty. Now, now they, they actually embrace it and, and they take it seriously as we do. Um, and, and to that extent, I think uh, it's, it's a positive, it's an overall positive for the academe, but it was very hard. I would say the hardest part overall has been with, with administrations, uh, with management level, having them understand uh, the value of this type of research in terms of cultural industries. And, and then you have to go back into uh, economic arguments and explain to uh, management types the percentage of the U.S. economy that runs on the cultural industry. Uh, happily, Marvel and DC have, have done us a favor. I mean, <laughs> nowadays when people go to the movies, well, when we all used to go to the movies, uh, it was, I mean, it didn't take much to understand that comics could move loads of money. Um, so. That is good. And, and look at how ironic it, it is now. Uh, one of the few areas of the economy that just keeps on trotting in the middle of a, a worldwide economic paralysis is the cultural industry. By way of you know, technology, people were not for streaming and, and all the services we may have to consume stuff that uh, educate us, educates us and stuff that uh, entertains us we would be bored out of our minds right now. And many people would not be productive. Um, so, yeah, that's... absolutely. And uh, we're seeing more than ever, um, you know, I mean, you're, you're a professor in world language and culture. Of course, we're in a very sort of privileged, sort of, we have privileged access to Zoom and all of these other ways, but world cultures you were just talking about a concert and images from around the world and it's 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 feeding us during this time where we're so deprived right um we're so hungry for contact human contact right yeah um uh, i'll share something with you I've, I've been teaching a course every semester for well except for when i have sabbaticals uh, for, I, I'd say right now it's like 10 years. I teach a course that it's on global issues and graphic narratives. And, and basically I have the kids re read, according to the semester in the selection, they will read from 10 to 14 graphic novels. And it's, it's graphic novels dealing with, you know, uh, issues all over the world. So it's, it, imagine it's, it's like a, a world trip. Uh, it's like, um, Remember when we used to study, um, when we had social studies classes back in, in K through 12? Well, this is the, the, the college version. Um, so these are big courses, and, and I like teaching big courses. Uh, I have assistants, happily, uh, but this course has ranged from 50 to 80 students. And, and for many of the students, it's, it's uh, an introduction to the world of graphic novels. Um, and by the end of the course, they're really into it and they become comics readers. Um, so that's, that's one example of, you know, in a sense, we're very sheltered because we, we managed to promote an industry in a way that, um, that we can make a, a, a good living, right? Uh, and it's enjoyable. Uh, and as many people say, when you, know, when you love your work, you don't work a single day in your life. Um, so for that, I, I acknowledge that we're all privileged. Uh, but I also think it's, it's good in terms of what we're doing with the students. Uh, once again, through this course, not only do they learn about comics in general, um, but, but they gain awareness of, uh, of the world, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of media literacy, in terms of cultural intelligence, uh, cultural competence, many ways. 
So moving into some of your very specific kind of work and um, directions in your work, Redrawing the Nation, um, the title of uh, your co-edited volume, um, what does that mean actually? Uh, you were just talking about world comics. So yeah, Redrawing the Nation. Redrawing, and, well, uh, the basic uh, thread of my research, uh, regardless of whether I work with comics or music or whatever, I, I usually center on, on issues of nation and identity. And in many cases, the practices of, of nationalism, uh, which most of the people in the world <laughs> practice nationalism in, in deep denial of their practice of nationalism. Um, so when that project in particular, when we started, the, the idea was, was almost, almost literal in, in terms of, you know, finding examples of, um, well, working with, with graphic novels and comics throughout the world where you can see a, a new delineation uh, of the nation. Uh, people are, are, you know, narrating the nation in a, in a different fashion. And in order to narrate in a different fashion, they, have, they need a graphic equivalent. So these images correspond to, to the ways in which they, they want to suggest uh, the nation has worked in the past, works in the present, should work in the future. Um, and and, and in, in this particular case for the book we, we covered, it, I tend to have this thing for hemispheric approaches, um, you know, clarifying that we are in a very privileged position in the state. So we always have a Latinx component, but then we have uh, production from elsewhere in the Americas. And we try to stay, we, we try to establish linkages. I, I've always argued that it's very difficult to understand Latinxes without understanding, uh, you know, the corresponding context in Latin America and vice versa, obviously, right? Uh, in many cases, we can't, Nowadays, we can't understand the situation in many Latin American countries without the rapport they have with Latinx communities in the States because Latinx communities, it's, uh, they feed and they nourish um, the, the life of many countries in Latin America. And they, they affect uh, their cultural choices. Uh, they affect the, the lifestyle for sure. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, it, that was part of, of the project of Redrawing the Nation. Were there any surprises? Uh, I don't, I mean, clearly, you know, you all, you have your work in here, um, but there are other contributors, other scholars. Were there any surprises for you um, in terms of comics being created that were really, you know, working in this mode to redraw the nation? Well, uh, in general, in general, I would have to say, um, it's not the case of what they worked in uh, for this volume, but uh, uh, Chile is doing wonderful work. Mm -hmm. uh, Chile is, um, let's say there's a lot of work right now being done in terms of memory. And uh, they're trying to assess multiple historic processes uh, from the past and, and address them in different ways so that they they feed the present uh, of any nation, perhaps not in the way supported by the establishment in the past. The, they're proposing new readings. Um, of, of, for example, the, the, uh, the coup d'etat, which overthrew Allende uh, in Chile, supported by the US and the CIA. Uh, the Argentines are doing the same thing. They've been working at memory for quite a while. Mexico has been doing uh, actually, in the past few years, very recently, um, there's there are two volumes in particular that I think are are quite worthwhile. Uh, one is called La Pirámide Cuarteada by uh, a cartoonist called Luis Fernando, and the other one is called Grito de Victoria by Augusto Mora. And uh, La Pirámide covers um, it's it's a coming of age uh, story but it covers the events of 1968. The first key instance of repression, you know, massive repression uh, and murder by the Mexican government. And then, uh, because it's a one-two punch, uh, happily Augusto Mora did Grito de Victoria. And Grito de Victoria narrates the events leading to the, 
Corpus Christi Massacre, which were covered in, in, the, in Roma, right? Uh, the film by Cuaron uh, that became so popular via Netflix. Um, and, and back when we, we had a conference uh, for a first ed edited volume, uh, we organized on rock all over the, the Americas. And we got together in Italy to, to discuss that. And I remember back then, this was early 2000s. Uh, the Mexican government wouldn't e even have tolerated uh, something of this nature uh, back in the early 2000s. So to see in the last two, three years, Mexican cartoonists uh, producing uh, volumes like of excellent quality that speak openly about the lack of democracy in Mexico. I mean, not to mention uh, the work by Edgar Clement on, on, he started working in the 90s with NAFTA, and more recently he has spoken about the war against drugs and how it has impacted, you know, working class communities, middle class communities, not the rich, but the regular folks in Mexico. Um, to see this sort of production uh, accepted, celebrated, um, circulating, um, in, in Mexico, it, it's wonderful. Uh, there, is, uh, there is an excellent graphic novel called Poder Asesino. Um, and it's, um, what's the name? I think it's Gabriel Kelly, I think. Uh, the guy is a, a filmmaker and he takes perhaps some of the, of the hardest events, you know, in terms of the war against Ross, and he starts with the idea of Salinas de Gortari, the, the Mexican president back in the 90s. Salinas de Gortari, the Mexican president, back when he was very young, uh, and this was kept hush-hush by his family, he, he shot a maid, uh, you know, at home. Um, they were playing, they were toying around with, with a gun, with a, with a rifle in the backyard, and, and with, he was with two other friends, and, and he shot uh, a maid. And the family was so powerful that the family bought, you know, all of the, all of the run, the print run for that, for the following day in Mexico City uh, to try to, you know, keep the news concealed. Well, in any case, uh, Kelly takes this story and from there, he narrates the life of, of a, uh, hypothetical Mexican president, though he's, this president is, is very, it's highly modeled on Salinas de Gortari and, and speaks about uh, the engagement between the government and the drug cartels and how certain um, characters within the, the, the party that managed the government, back then the PRI, um, already, wanted, you know, uh, perhaps a change in the, in the government model for Mexico. And the book ends with, um, with the demise of, the, of a new presidential can candidate, uh, which is based on, on real life events, right? Uh, the death of Colosio uh, back in Tijuana. Um, now, the really neat thing with this graphic novel is that it, it has um, an interactive component. It has quick response codes. And, and you scan the quick response codes and uh, it'll, it'll show material that supports uh, in real life the events covered uh, fictionally in the graphic novel because the graphic novel doesn't mention, you know, it uses fiction, it uses other characters, but then it alludes to real life circumstances uh, that inspired each of these events. Uh, there's, there's, two particularly gruesome uh, events. One was um, the, the wife of, of a drug cartel le leader, she, she had an affair with uh, somebody else and she fled to the US. And it turned out the guy she had an affair with was just working with another cartel. And supposedly he, he beheaded her and returned the head via mail to El Guero Palma, uh, the head of one of the cartels in Mexico. Uh, that's one. So when you, when you embrace the application and you look at it interactively, you can see all the press coverage uh, of the time and, and you know, 
uh, see more information. And, and another one is um, something that was really popular in Mexico. Um, I don't know whether you uh, uh, ever saw it. It had to do with our narco satanic sect uh, led by a, a Cuban American uh, who moved to Mexico to work as a model. And, and the guy was, was doing, you know, horrible things. And fortunately he was discovered because at some point they had uh, the cluelessness to actually kidnap a kid who was a student uh, at the University of Texas. And then uh, the American embassy got involved and uh, quite obviously under pressure, the pressure of the Mexican police started investigating a lot more. And finally, you know, through a stroke of luck, they discovered this. But these are the sort of events covered in, in, in the graphic novel. It's called Poder Asesino. And um, when I look at it, I, I think in five years ago, nothing like this could have been published in Mexico. Redrawing, redrawing not just the nation, but redrawing the kind of the boundaries, right, um, in these different spaces. Um, of what can be shown and told. Um, I know uh, you've worked on race and gender in Mexican comics, beloved comics, right? Kaliman and and what what are you what did you discover in that particular work, for instance? Well, that that was that was something I worked on because I was trying to understand uh, our culture. You know, when you see, when you see uh, Latinxes and, and you see the differences, the disparities in, in uh, approaches between one generation and, and, and the following one, you know, uh, the Latinxes were born or perhaps raised or educated in the U.S. and previous generations. And you sort of look at the cultural production that previous generations consumed uh, because they, they definitely have a huge influence in terms of uh, values and and the way people look at at many aspects of life. Um, in the case of Kaliman, uh, Kaliman is um, is a, a a Mexican superhero, but is is a very particular Mexican superhero because he's based in the Far East. Um, so in in my perspective, what was really interesting about this, and and this was nourished by by the winds of time, the fact that 9-11 um, generated, let's say, tension between U.S. culture and, and uh, the Muslim world and, you know, in other places. And having consumed uh, Edward Said's theory back in the 90s, I went back to it and, and I tried to apply it to, to Kaliman and, and demonstrate how Orientalism, uh, the use of the Orient, of the East, to validate uh, a hegemonic order at home is not just a practice of the Europeans and, and uh, the U.S. government or, you know, the U.S. cultural establishment, cultural and political establishment, but also a practice embraced by uh, political, cultural, and economic establishments all over uh, Latin America. Um, so Kaliman, eh, as, a, as a pop culture comic is something that is not only consumed in Mexico. I mean, many of many Latin exes are familiar with Kaliman uh, across the border. For a long time, it was also a radio series, a very successful radio series, and it was broadcast across the border. Um, because obviously the radio stations around across the border would beam signals all the way deep into Texan territory and parts of Arizona. Uh, but regardless, there was a very, um, there was a very healthy market consuming uh, the Kaliman comic books uh, within Latinx communities in the States. So um, my, my basic uh, exploration into Kaliman, um, it just shows how, how uh, the cultural industry will use a, a, an oriental type, you know, to validate certain prejudices uh, certain ways of, of looking at race and gender and validating, you know, uh, disparities in terms of race and gender uh, back in Mexico and within Latinx communities uh, in the U.S. 
So it, it's not just it's not just a practice of you know rich countries. It's it's also a part of of a Latin American graphic tradition to do that, and and that's that was basically the result. When when I wrote about Kaliman, I I dissect the comic, and I I showed particular instances in which uh, there are contradictions in terms of race of Kaliman. Kaliman is is posited as a superhero that comes from the far east but then you would look at at the there was a film and and the main character was a, a a u.s citizen it was he was an american so they they imported an american a guy with you know sure he got tan but he was blonde and blue-eyed and he would play the role of kaliman so it was a way a, a widened orient to put it in a way the guy would would embrace this uh, this attire that would you know uh, present him as somebody coming from the far east, but in the end, what it would validate would be um, a very Eurocentric look uh, concealed in a in a, an Oriental package. So it it would uh, it would validate for readers the notion that a certain racial order was correct. Uh, to the detriment of working and middle classes uh, in Mexico and across the border. In your work, your book length work on Lalo Alcaraz, you turn to, um, well, the comic strip um, and, well, satire, right? Mm -hmm. So tell me, like, First of all, dedicating a lot of time, scholarly time, energy, labor to one creator is significant. It's telling the world something already there. But um, yeah, why um, this project and what can we kind of take away from it um, again in a sort of encapsulation? A, Lalo is perhaps one of the most, if not the most, critical voice uh, within the circle of cartoonists and illustrators of the Latinx community. Um, and he has surely paid the price for it. Um, back when La Cucaracha was, was established uh, comic strip nationwide, it, it has you know, increasingly generated backlash. I don't, I don't even wanna go over you know, the amount of hatred and vitriol that that he has been exposed to, um, because he had he he did really good work. He still does very good work. Uh, through so through his comic strips, he I I think perhaps nobody else, no one else has done as good as a, a job as as Lalo, documenting and chronicling, you know, all the efforts against the Latinx community in terms of uh, legal projects, in terms of uh, bills that, that uh, endorse discrimination of Latinxes. Um, and one thing that, that Lalo's production is really good at, uh, and, and to that extent, it's an excellent uh, text for classes, it, it allows us to explore you know, the dynamics of of the cultural order and of, of the fabrication of a cultural order and determine how is it that we perceive a certain cultural order as natural. And, and we come to terms with the fact, if we embrace it critically, if, uh, if we examine it, uh, with the notion that, sure, there is something akin to a universal cultural order, but it's like an exam, right? Uh, exams have ideal examinees. So the more you depart from the ideal examinee, the more uncomfortable you feel with exam. Well, it's the same thing with the culture. Uh, our culture, the U.S. culture, has usually been, been designed around, you know, a major demographic component. And as our country changes, and our country is not changing now, our, our country has always changed. I mean, ever since it was formed, it has always changed. So this is, we're not talking about anything new. Uh, it, it's important to Latinx to the extent that now it's changing in such a way that we, we have, uh, even within all the invisibility that we suffer, we have more of a presence. 
I always tell my students that Latinxs are roughly one out of every six Americans. So if you look around and you don't recognize, you know, that ratio, one out of six within your surroundings, that means two things. Uh, either all Latinxs are piled up in key locations within U.S. geography. I could say, for example, South Florida, where five out of, out of six are definitely Latinxs. Uh, or else you're in, in a setting where, where there's a remarkable degree of absence and integration, uh, which could be read and construed as exclusion, right? Uh, well, Lalo's work is perfect for that because Lalo addresses uh, how the present uh, cultural order is one that has been based on, a, on certain demographics. And those demographics have changed. And we haven't done much to, to change the fabric of that cultural order. Um, it's like when you have a shirt or when you have any, any product and, and you try it and it doesn't fit very well. Well, guess why it, it doesn't fit very well? Because it was created for somebody else. And that may have been valid years ago when most of the people, uh, you know, that church or whatever, it fit them well. But now increasingly the population has shifted in such a way that that product no longer applies that, that well. And, and so that cultural order with which many people were born into the cultural order will live. And, and little by little, critically, we gain uh, cognizance of the fact that perhaps that cultural order was not meant to include certain groups. Uh, one obviously being Latinxes, and and there are obviously other groups that are that are uh, increasingly visible uh, within the U.S. population. So Lalo's production is ideal for that. He he will he will obviously he will he will address you know uh, because he he denounces that order uh, by illustrating you know very specifically you know aspects of our life where the cultural norm is designed for somebody else and not for latinos and what he does is he will imagine a neighborhood and he will latinize it all by latinizing it that by latinizing the entire neighborhood it becomes very clear clear that you have to change the neighborhood for its appeal to to latinxes and you have to do that because uh, the way the neighborhood is initially, it's designed for somebody else, quite obviously. Uh, and, and perhaps that somebody else uh, was, you know, a major common denominator in the past, but, you know, the demographics of the country are, are changing by, well, now I don't know what's going to happen because with this and many other things, but theoretically, the, the U.S. Census Bureau said that 2043, 2044, the country would be a non-majority country, right? Uh, so it's, I mean, we're within reach of, of a moment where the country needs to change uh, because then the degree, if we don't change the degree of social, racial, uh, gender exclusion will be such that that it will it will be problematic. Uh, it will be problematic to the fabric of U.S. identity. Hector, there's something very powerful as well about the use of the visual as a dominant way of engaging an audience. With, of course, the text there to give it the nuance. Um, in a culture that is so driven by the visuals, right? Um, so yeah, what about your work and your, your real passion and interest in excavating the comic strip, the comic book, the image as a generator or a regenerator of meaning um, because of the medium itself? Well, that, uh, let's, let's try to be careful about this. Um, that has to do, um, my background, my bachelor's is in electrical engineering. But back when I was growing up, one of my uncles was a cartoonist. He, he, he currently, well, he was a cartoonist. He currently lives in Canada. Um, but something I've always argued is our students, millennials, and even the ones before, 
who grew in, in constant contact with, with technology via the internet. Um, they're, they represent generations that, cons that consume more information than any previous generation. Uh, it is my belief that they read much more than previous generations. They just read in different ways. Uh, so my focus on, on the graphic aspect was my, my attempt to relate in a better manner with my students because my, our professional training was highly rooted on the power of the written word, on lettered prejudice. And, and while I, I, you know, delighted in, in the power of the word, uh, I also delighted in the power of the image. And I recognized that uh, by way of the internet, we were seeing a change in, in the sensibilities and in the way of understanding and, and assessing information of new generations. Our students are audio visual. Our students are not strictly about the written text. And because our students have been raised with the means to spread out images, to convey images, they learn better and, and they understand better by way of images. Uh, and I think that has a lot to do with the boom of the graphic novel. Uh, the boom of the graphic, well, the graphic novel started in the 80s, as, as we all know, uh, or established itself in, in the 80s. And from there on, it just, you know, went on and ran with things. But the, it's the way, the way Art Spiegelman says. Art Spiegelman says that comics have gone, something of the sort, like comics have gone from, from being uh, perceived as not appropriate for, for readers to be in perhaps the last bastion of defense of, of the written, you know, a written information, you know, by way of support with, with imagery. So when I, when I looked at, at the power of images, I, I see it as, as a channel, a vehicle of access to the sensibilities of my students, mm -hmm. because they, my students and your students, I'm sure too, the ones who are, who may consume uh, this video, uh, they're used to it. They're used to uh, taking cues from, from images uh, and reading the images in, in a better way than just the written text. Um, quite recently, I was talking to a colleague in my department. She's a linguist. And her research deals with, with uh, reading. And she once you know, shared her research with a few of us. And every, everything in her, in her research was geared towards written language. And my question to her was, so what are you using to assess the contribution uh, of the images, the way the students are reading not only the written language, but the images that support the stories in this text? Because she was using books that were illustrated. And, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a key gap in, in today's uh, academic world, at least within the humanities. We need to be, do a better job at, um, at sharing the value of imagery as a pedagogic tool. Speaking of which, um, and we've been talking a lot about teaching, but let me ask you, Hector, is there a trademark Hector kind of thing or activity that you have in your classroom space with comics that really kind of, you know, take the students somewhere new and wildly different? Well, I, I, teach, I teach Socratic, you know, so uh, I, I don't like lecturing much. Um, I, I always tell my students that ideally I'll, I'll share theory with them when I, I believe it, uh, it's relevant, when I, I believe it's necessary to make more out of the text. Uh, but I always tell them at the beginning of the semester that hopefully by the end of the semester, I'll just be a moderator. And usually that's the way my classes proceed. Uh, I speak a lot more at the beginning than at the end. Uh, I would say by 25% into the semester, I'm already moderating. And, and each class is totally different because I'll, I'll design a backbone. I'll design, you know, I'll, I'll come up with a corpus of text. Um, I had a seminar on Latinx, a graduate seminar on Latinx, uh, uh, graphic novels recently 
And the way I, I design it, I just have the backbone around the, the, the graphic text. But then I allow the students to make comments, to share their readings, and just to take the course and run away with it in whatever direction they want. Uh, in, I, and I think that's usually a lot more productive than trying to impose on students a particular reading or view. I will, I will share my reading of a text, but I'll, I'll be the first one to clarify, this is just my reading. And I don't want you to clone my reading. I don't even want you to share my reading. I want to, I'm interested in, in what you guys have to say and, and new ways, new approaches in, into this because we all come from, from different walk, walks of life, right? And, and by way of experiences, we all address uh, and, and engage a text in, in different manners. So that's, that's usually, students are, are very used to uh, my approach. They know how classes are gonna be and they know that gradually it's, they're gonna be, they, they have to talk. In other words, I have very few wallflowers in my, my courses. Imagine a course that's 50 or to 80 strong and, and I try to have every single student contribute mm. and, and sense, say something. And, and some students are great. They, they can talk, you know, for a full hour. And some students are just terrified mm. of the fact that they have to speak about, you know, a graphic text before a class of people they don't know. Uh, and by the end of the course, they, 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 they master it by the end of the course, because I think, I think the images um, appear to them a lot more, a lot friendlier, you know, instead of, uh, let's say, the habitual dense theoretical text shared with students at a certain level. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I'll be the first one to support theory, but uh, I'm not going to enshrine, enshrine theory with jargon. In other words, uh, graphic novels are a great tool to share, you know, um, valid theory with students at a at a good level, you know. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine your classrooms are so dynamic, and the way you are so careful to listen and kind of take students in the direction that they're moving, but so that they can deepen their understanding, right, on their terms. I, I imagine it's a really incredible space. Um, what about, um, what my, I guess my next question, uh, as we get to the end of this um, lecture, this discussion, our conversation, where, where are you excited about Latinx comics, comics in general? You've talked about world comics, we've talked about Lalo's work, um, gender and race and Mexican comics redrawing boundaries, redrawing the nation. What's exciting for you today, Ekta? I'll tell you what is exciting. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to look at uh, Latin comics production that doesn't come from the, the usual places. Um, I'm trying to, that's it. It's, it's, it's amazing how uh, the dynamics of the industry uh, work, right? Um, I'm, I've been hanging around with uh, Victor Laval's Destroyer for quite a while. I, I keep reading it and thinking about it to see what's going to come up. Um, I'm very much into what is being published in South Florida. There is a, there's a, a very solid community that has a very different take on, on many aspects. Um, they, they are, let's say, markedly different from what you can get in New York. So I'm, I'm beginning at this point, uh, in terms of different axes of production, you know, Southern California, the New York metro area, South Florida, I believe that we were at a crucial moment where each of those locations is beginning to, to nurture uh, common characteristics. And we're being able now to perceive a much more solid profile uh, of the type of production um, they bring out. In other words, almost to the extent that you can read something and you can say, this is from Miami, mm. or this is from New York, this is from uh, Southern California. So it, that to me um, speaks of a certain maturity in the industry. 
I don't think Latinx comics are, we're still at the periphery, but um, now at least there has been some continuity. Uh, so the people who are working now can look back and, and uh, look at the way certain topics were addressed in the past and choose to incorporate them into their work um, in a way that informs, but in a way such that it, they don't overtake new, new perspectives on, on topics, on, on situations that are affecting the Latin community. Um, most recently, I've been working, did you, have you, I imagine you've seen, you've seen everything. Uh, the, the volume brought out by United Way after the hurricane in Puerto Rico. Um, and um, I'm, I'm writing something on that at present. And I read it with much interest. And the conclusion I, I got from that, because many of the texts in, in, the, in the graphic novel make it clear that uh, the cartoonists and the illustrators and the, and the narrators are interested in Puerto Rico, even though many of them haven't even shared um, a childhood or an adolescence in Puerto Rico. Because now with more Puerto Ricans living in, in continental USA than on, on the island, um, it gives me the feel that comics are, are becoming a way to develop a, a prosthetic memory about Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rican identity as part of, of Latinx identity is becoming one, uh, one of the first examples of uh, rooted in the prosthetic memory of a nation. They're, they're imagining uh, Puerto Rican identity uh, by way of somebody else's memories. Mm. Uh, and that to me appears really interesting because it, it's, it's like, um, it's like a lifeline. It's a lifeline into many Latino communities, many Latinx communities in the States. Uh, to the extent that research shows that Spanish will die out in, after th three generations because we're not doing that much of an effort to nourish the Spanish, to keep it alive. Um, at least the culture and, and, and certain forms of identity uh, may survive. Uh, not only by way of technology, but by way of cultural practices like comics, you know, that I find very, very validating that I think it, it's, it's a good thing. Puerto Rico strong as the comic where the collection that yeah. we're talking about here. Um, Hector, uh, what can I say? This has been like riveting, so enriching for me, for the listeners, the viewers. Um, Latinx comics matter uh, in ways that are profound. The prosthetic memory that you were just talking about um, for new generations. Thank you, Hector. Thank you, Betty. And it's been a pleasure. Uh, and uh, I wish you the best. And please stay safe.